Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lion Burger Construction and Berglund Center, where live entertainment lives in the Roanoke Valley. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guest today is a professor of economics at Roanoke College who also doubles as senior analyst for the college's Institute for Policy and Opinion Research. Dr. Alice Louise Cassens is the John S. Shannon Professor of Economics at Roanoke College. Alice, welcome to the show. Thanks for having nice me. Nice to finally meet you in the flesh. Yes, a lot of talking on the radio. Exactly, exactly. Um, let's just dive right into it. As we go to taping, we're a couple of weeks out from your sold out presentation on the great resignation to the Regional Chamber of Commerce. One of the slides you sent me stated that 4.5 people, 4.5 million people quit their jobs in November out of 149 million people employed nationwide and 44 million people have quit their jobs since February 2021. Let's start there. Has there ever been another period like this where people quit their jobs as opposed to losing their jobs in, in U.S. history? Not in these numbers. We started collecting this particular data in the end of 2000, so it's not that old. Um, but as far as we know, even before it, we haven't had a period in which this not many people in proportion, share of the total employed, have quit their jobs. Uh, and it's been going on since February 2021, so it's termed the Great Resignation. Right. And yet we've had record job growth last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and we've had all these people voluntarily quitting their jobs, but every month since the Great Resignation started, we've had more people getting hired. So when hires are greater than the total separations, which mm -hmm. quits is a part of, employment grows. So is this kind of driving employers crazy or you know, as they were try to recruit people? It's got to be driving them crazy. When I spoke with folks at the chamber, they, they were mainly from the other side of the labor market trying to hire people. And the job turnover that they're facing, trying to get people to take jobs, is incredibly frustrating. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, okay, so what, where's the COVID factor in all this? Obviously, this has something to do with COVID. Um, you know, what, if anything, did the relief checks that people were getting, this is something you hear some people saying that, the relief checks that people were getting for a while on top of their unemployment uh, gave people pause and maybe they looked at what they really wanted to do. But what, what was the factor that COVID had in all this? I think it kicked it off. Uh, so not the factor driving it right now, but what kicked it off with all the people getting layoffs. So a lot of layoffs happened in March of 2020. Uh, and then there were people who didn't want to re-enter the labor market because of fears of COVID, but also it didn't pay to re-enter the market because of the relief they were getting was more than they get in the labor market. But, and what that did was it created a shortage of workers. And so wages started rising. And so now the challenge is people see all this opportunity around them. So they have a job and they're switching sometimes across industries, sometimes within industries. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I believe COVID kicked it off, but because of the resultant higher wages, we're seeing people facing opportunities, good opportunities they never had before. Mm -hmm. And you, in your presentation, you talked about there's different reasons for people quitting you have the frustrated, the dreamers, and the optimizers. And did this whole thing just give people pause and time to maybe think about what they wanted to do? Yes, you know, I borrowed those terms from economist Betsy Stevenson. She does such a great job of, of describing things going on in the economy. You know, people are quitting their jobs for these many reasons, um, all driven by the fact they're trying to prioritize themselves amongst this um, great amount of opportunity that they've never had before. You hear stories mainly about the frustrated, right? Those are the ones that make the great stories, those mm -hmm. that just have had it with customers, mistreating them, maybe a bad manager. And so now there are wages that are higher in jobs they can, they have the skills for. And so they quit their job and they move on. Mm -hmm. One of the things you said, and this makes perfect sense, is all else being equal, if demand for goods or services increases, demand for the workers who produce those goods for services also increases. Are, are we seeing, we, we've seen an explosion of demand since COVID restrictions started being lifted. And recently, as we go to taping, pretty much all, most of the restrictions are listed. So do you expect to even see more demand for, for goods and services and workers? Yes, our recession was very short, the pandemic uh, recession, and since then, demand has been gangbusters. Uh, and so because of that, employers are needing more and more workers. So we see these job openings increase. And demand is likely going to continue increase, although we have the factor of inflation coming in. Right. Uh, and so that may temper some of the demand. We'll have to see. How is this, you mentioned, how is this different than the Great Recession of 
2008. The Great Recession, there were underlying fundamentals in our economy. Uh, you, know, you had the housing market, the banking sector, you know, so all these th issues that were at play, and it just came crumbling down. And so we had a two plus year uh, economic recession that was so very long, but also very deep mm -hmm. and severe. Whereas the pandemic recession, we had COVID come in, there was nothing wrong with our underlying economy. It was very strong. Uh, we'd been growing for the longest expansion we'd had on record, but then this outside force came in and wreaked havoc on our economy. But because the economy was so strong, that's how we were able to rebound so quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the things with the 2008 recession was the, the housing bubble and inflated uh, housing prices. Now we've seen housing prices go up sharply are you afraid that that's going to happen at all, or, or if they raise interest rates like they're talking about, that that might kind of tamper down that demand for housing? I, we'll have to see, I believe next month is when we're going to see some changes from the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, and so there's a lot of questioning of how much they're going to raise rates. Uh, and if it's significant, because some people think they're going to go in pretty hard to try to slow things down. And if that's the case, demand will be pulled back. Um, and we'll have, in, on the supply side, we'll have some issues as well. Um, but their whole goal is to try to get a hold on inflation, because mm -hmm. it's certainly growing at levels that they're not comfortable right. with. Yeah, it's a, as we go to tape, it's like seven and a half percent. And it's been 40 years, I think, since we've seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the president was saying when he did this State of the Union uh, that he attributed like a third of it, uh, that inflation rate, to, to car prices going up. Yes. Okay, so if you take that out of the equation, is it a lot better? Do we, do we, is the, does the inflation mark look better, or, or do you have to put that in the equation? Well, that I inflation statistic we hear about the consumer price index uh, includes all the typical goods that consumers buy, mm -hmm. and new cars and used cars are in there, as is fuel and all those things right. that we frequently buy. And right now, the used car industry in particular has had uh, over 40% increase year-on-year -year growth in prices. Wow. Um, and so, of course, that's weighted because um, uh, it's not the only thing. Thing mm -hmm. in, in the total basket of goods, but it is certainly driving a large share of that consumer price index, which is what we get our inflation rate from. Right, I mean, used car prices, I think they're averaging in the 40s now, 40,000 range, so it makes used cars even more attractive, which drives up the price of the used cars, I guess. Yes, and this got started in, in part during the um, during the recession that we most recently had with new cars weren't able to be produced. And so people started switching from buying new cars since they couldn't find them to use cars right. and it ate up that supply. Uh, and so now we just have a shortage which is pushing up those prices. Right. And of course, one of the reasons for the shortage of new cars is we ran out of semiconductors. Exactly. And I know Intel's gonna be, build a big mega plant in, in Ohio, but um, it's all kind of, it's interesting how things get all connected in economics. <laughs> and I guess this is one of the things you teach your students yes. too. That economics happens. is everywhere. <laughs> right, right. And you were saying, in, uh, well, before we started, that this is a very interesting time to be an economics professor. Yes, it is. I'm a, by training a labor economist. So this labor market that we're in with the great resignation, uh, while I know that people are very frustrated with their employers, but I tell my students it's a great time to be graduating into this labor market because of high wages. Mm -hmm. But selfishly, it's a fascinating time to be an economist <laughs> because there are all these things that we can study, these questions we're trying to answer that are puzzles, and it's a challenge but an enjoyable one to try to figure out. Yeah, b before I forget to ask it, uh, the Federal Reserve is talking about raising interest rates mm -hmm. incrementally this year. How much difference does that make when it comes to taming inflation historically? Has it made a lot of difference? Yes. Uh, when we've done this before, when we've had inflation coming up at these rates, it has met, made a big difference. Unfortunately, in the past, when we've really put the brakes on the economy through rising in interest rates by a significant amount, coming out of the blocks hard, like I pr think they are going to do, it does run the risk of having a recession. Really? So that's going all the way in the other way, yeah? Yes. So, so the best thing to do is what, raise it fractions of a point, that type of thing? Or? Well, I'll stick to my knitting and leave that to okay. the monetary economists. But from what I've read, um, mm -hmm. I think their hope is to go in hard early so that they don't have to have a lot of rate increases. Okay. And so people kind of get adjusted to the whole. And they can see quickly how it's going to respond. Right. I, I want to ask you something. Uh, you know, employers are having their ratchet up starting pay, offer signing on bonuses in some cases. I know President Biden's talked about a, 
uh, a national minimum $15 mm -hmm. an hour wage, but does that factor into the inflation rate? Uh, is there such a thing as a wage price spiral? Oh, sure. Uh, whenever you have uh, employers, and by the way, a lot of them are having to pay w well above $15 an hour uh, to get employees to come in. Whenever you have to raise wages, that's an increase in costs, and businesses, understandably, try to pass that cost on to customers in the form of higher prices. That's one way they can do that. And so if lots of employers are doing that, that's going to increase prices and thus inflation. So kind of a vicious cycle, huh? It sure is. <laughs> Um, we're also seeing record numbers of retirements. That's another thing you talked about, the great resignation. Is, uh, I was just wondering, um, is that a, kind of a double-edged sword for businesses? You know, you bring in some new blood, but you lose some institutional memory, maybe loss of productivity. Uh, certainly. It's a challenge they're facing and one that's uh, confounding them finding employees right now because we had more, about 2 million more people retired during the last year than we had predicted. Um, a lot of it is likely getting frustrated with the way the jobs changed during the pandemic with social distancing and online, Zoom, etc. Uh, and so we had many more retiring than economists had anticipated. But from an employer's perspective, you lose a lot of experience, uh, people that can help train the young workforce. So that may mean that managers have to do a lot more training on their own, which can um, I I reduce productivity. Mm -hmm. um, are we, are we pa we're past the peak of the great resignation, correct? Are we, uh, does it look like what are your charts show that it looked like it was yeah. coming down? Uh, well, it's been moving up and down quite a bit. So November, we hit that um, record number, four and a half million, but the previous number had been in September. So we kind of get a month on, a month off. So before it's, I would be comfortable saying it's over, I'd like to see a few more months um, mm -hmm. of, of information. It will finish itself out as people that want to switch make the switch right. um, so it's not going to go on forever but is it over quite yet I'm not sure but sooner or later people need to get a job I guess they don't have so many savings they can rely on that type of thing well a lot of this is people who are quitting a job to take another one uh, and while they may not make the match immediately they may go get some more training and whatnot these are largely people who see higher wages and are switching jobs but that switching process the people will find that job they want to go to and that switch will be made mm -hmm. and will be back to more normal quit mm -hmm. rates and i guess these labor shortages alice have given workers and new hires a, a bargaining edge they may have not have it's, it had in recent years is this a good time to be in that position where you maybe you have a little bit more of a bargaining edge or you're going to get a better offer. It, the employees definitely have leverage right now um, because employers desperately need workers. Um, they can't keep workers that they have. Um, they're trying to, it's a very hard time to get new workers in the door. Uh, and so I tell my students uh, over at Roanoke College, especially my seniors that are about to graduate, this is a great time to be graduating because this labor market uh, is paying very well mm -hmm. uh, and work employers are struggling to find workers. And mm -hmm. so you can fill that hole for them. I'm wondering if employers too, if they're gonna have to hire people at a higher salary, maybe they're gonna want workers to get more training or have them be more productive. If they have to pay $25 an hour instead of 20 or 15 or something, they're going to want more bang for their buck. So it could be good for both sides. Right, so it, it could be. I think right now the employers, are, the negotiating or the leverage is on the employee side, but you know, eventually that may wane, and so employers may be demanding more uh, of their workers. But there are a lot of employers now, in order to fill these gaps, and employees are doing a lot of education and training on site so that they can promote people from a lower level job to a higher one um, to, to retain them, right. and it also gives them those skills. That's another the thing, too, is, um, and I know I go, this, go through this with one of my kids, um, they, uh, you know, she wants to learn once she's going up and she's not afraid of taking on more responsibility. Mm -hmm. So employers really need to be tuned in yes. to what their employees want. Well, and that can increase productivity. If, if you, there's some line of thought that says as you pay workers more, they uh, feel better about their job and thus they become more productive. Um, so there could be some benefits mm -hmm. to this. Leisure and hospitality got really hit, I think, the worst, uh, mm -hmm. retail also, but uh, uh, leisure and hospitality, as far as the quits, almost double any other sector on that a graph you sent me, yep. especially 
accommodations and food services. Are employers going to have to rethink some of their business models maybe? I think they already are. Wages in those industries uh, are up over 10% uh, recently. So the wages are growing, uh, which is probably why the quits are so much higher because they're seeing all this other opportunity. But we do see employers moving um, their business models. You, know, you see restaurants, these ghost kitchens that don't serve anyone in-house. They just make food right. and it's for delivery only. So there are evolutions happening in the business sector that are, again, fascinating to watch. And some of it is adapting to the pandemic, but some of it's adapting to to the labor market right now. You talked about the ghost kitchens where people share a shared kitchen space between mm -hmm. different food services. And I think uh, during the really COVID lockdown, people got used to eating at home and mm -hmm. getting having prepared meals come in. And in some cases, it's cheaper to do that than to buy all the ingredients and, and all that. So, so yeah, it's kind of a different model. And I know restaurants here in, in Roanoke, Alice, that are changing their model. They've cut back on their food service. Yep. Uh, I know a restaurant that closed down to reimagine what they were gonna do in the future. I've heard of the Greenbrier. Somebody told me the Greenbrier, at least for a while, they couldn't get dishwashers. So they were bringing in rented china mm -hmm. and silverware and then having it brought out to be to washed and all that. So, I mean, just kind of a whole, whole new world. Yeah, business owners are creative and they adapt. Uh, if you don't adapt, you're not going to survive. And we're certainly seeing that play out um, in, in this post-pandemic mm -hmm. world. I, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, as we hopefully end the COVID era, uh, is there like one major lesson or set of lessons that the business world learned about this, about how to be prepared for something like this or, or you know, anything you see that is a, is a long term lesson that can be learned from this whole thing? I, I guess one could say just always be prepared for, for the unknown. I think we get comfortable, uh, all of us did, in the economic expansion we had had, that it was the longest one on record. And I think we all got comfortable with the stock market going crazy. It still is. <laughs> it, right. I don't, it's its own beast. Um, and, and so then this pandemic came along and just changed our world. Uh, and not that we should always be fearing a pandemic. Right. You know, I think we should live our lives. Um, but be ready to pivot. Um, and be creative. And I think a lot of business owners and, and households have done so and done so very well. Right. When you look at the uh, record job growth, we talked about that already, but record or, or very strong gross domestic product growth, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Talk about what, for the uninf uh, uninformed, what is gross domestic product? So it's this fancy phrase, <laughs> essentially, for measuring all the spending we do in our economy. And by everyone, I mean households, businesses, the government, and then what we do through trade, exports and imports. And so that's the measure, the dollar measure that we use to de determine if we are in a recession. So if we have a significant period of time that that's declining, then the government says we are officially in a recession. Mm. And that's what certainly what happened um, for a few months uh, during the pandemic, but then we have been out of it. And so that is because GDP has been increasing. So mm -hmm. we can just think of it as demand is rising, essentially. And this was a very short recession, correct? Very short, it was one quarter, right. less than a quarter, in fact. And like you said, a lot of it had because there were, there were, the underlying underpinnings were still good. Yes, and it was this imposed um, situation where there was people were afraid to go out, but also we had mandatory stay-at-home orders, uh, closure of non-essential businesses. So it was a, an imposed shutdown of the economy, which was quite different than the traditional recession. I'm just wondering, what are your, what are your students, what do they ask about, about all this? What, what, what are they most curious about when it comes to current conditions, whether it's inflation, uh, you know, uh, job growth, whatever? Is there something that today's students are really curious about? I'd say all of it. They're interested in, in prices because certainly they are buying things themselves. Gas, um, food, yeah. Yeah, they're very interested in prices because those big ones, the gas prices, for example, that really eats into a college student's budget. Uh, and so that's something they're interested in, but also the labor market, especially the seniors, as they're thinking about their job for next year. Uh, so I'd say those two numbers. My husband is an economist. He teaches international trade and finance. And so in there, he gets a lot of questions uh, about trade. Mm -hmm. as well. Do a lot of larger businesses employ economists or at least have consultants on, 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 on it seems to me at this point in time you really like to be a, ha, able to have someone either on board or a consulting that can really read the tea leaves. Yes, there are economists in everywhere. We're everywhere. You can't get away from us, Gene. <laughs> and so the government is a big uh, uh, hire of uh, economists across all different agencies, but also uh, all your big businesses, whether it's finance, um, if it's retail, et cetera, their home offices, if they're very large, have economists. Mm -hmm. Why is it that sometimes, and I'm not you know, pointing fingers, but <laughs> why is it sometimes, Alice, that like they'll, they'll project 
they'll predict, oh, we're going to get 300,000 jobs this, this month, and then 140 show up or something. What is it that's so hard about predicting some of that stuff? So all of these are prediction models. So it's a mathematical equation that everyone develops their own formula because they think theirs is better than the next person's. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's reliant upon the model itself, but also the, the data that you're putting in. And so if you're trying to predict, say, uh, what the unemployment rate is going to be uh, on Friday, right? We have another number coming out on Friday. They're putting in prior data. And so our economy is operating very differently than it has. So that historical data isn't very helpful for mm -hmm. predicting today's economy. And so a lot of the numbers are way off. Another part of it is that it's hard to get the data. So if the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, employers are filling out their surveys uh, over a longer period of time. They're just not getting back to them as quickly. Right. And so we have a lot of updates in the numbers that are happening because of that as well. So it, it makes it very difficult to get a good prediction. But predictions are all uh, <laughs> you know, garbage in, garbage out uh -huh. is what you're going to get. And I know sometimes you'll see even a a revision a month or two later of January numbers so updated in March or something. So. Right, so those are the government numbers that are the, the revisions and a lot of that that's going right on right now um, in part is that it's taking longer to get the data from the establishments that are submitting the data say for the unemployment rate and all the data that comes from that uh, monthly report and so they have to do massive revisions on employment. Is it just not a priority for these people or? Uh, I, I think they are so overwhelmed right mm -hmm. now right. Uh, that, yes, they have other priorities like finding workers. <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> yes, and so I, I think it's just not their top priority. Mm -hmm. we, we, you touched on, but I want to talk about energy prices, mm -hmm. gas, fuel, oil, that type of thing. Um, you know, it's a killer for a lot of people, and, and, and that also helps drive up food costs because transportation costs and all that. Uh, you know, where gas prices are now at the pump, that type of thing, uh, if, if they go down a dollar in, in a month or two, how much better will that be for the economy? Will that nip at the inflation rate or what? Uh, it will, because fuel is one of the uh, items that goes into the calculation, it most certainly would cause inflation to come down, assuming other things don't go up in its place. Um, but I think a bigger role that it would play is in how people feel about the economy. Uh, and so how we think about the economy is doing isn't so much what we hear um, analysts say on television, rather what, how, what impacts us day to day. And filling up your car, going to the grocery store, these are constant reminders. And so if you see gas prices fall by a dollar, you're going to feel great. You're so excited. Uh, and so you are maybe go buy some other things. And that's going to stimulate the economy. Huh. Yeah, I know every time I uh, either go to the grocery store or the gas pump, you know, a lot of people are, were, are wincing, which brings me to yes. the, uh, uh, something else you're involved with at the, at the uh, Institute for Policy and Opinion Research. Mm -hmm. You're an analyst at the Virginia Index of Consumer Sentiment, which I find interesting. And this is something you measure every quarter. Yes. Quarter you, you survey about, what, 600 people or so. Um, how inflation and employment and even the politics help shape that number. Talk about those numbers and, and what drives consumer sentiment up and down in Virginia. So this is a measurement we've been doing since November of 2011, uh, and we uh, use the same methodology that University of Michigan does for the national number. And so it tells us how consumers, we call only Virginians, uh, and we get 600 completed surveys that go into our calculations. And it tells us how Virginians are feeling about their household finances, about what they think the economy is going to do over the next five to 10 years. And so we put these things together into this number we call the Consumer Sentiment Index. And it tells us how people are feeling about things. And that is, has been shown to be a good predictor for how much people spend on goods and services both today, mm -hmm. but also tomorrow. So if you're a retail business owner or something, mm -hmm. that's probably a number you should look at, consumer sentiment, how people feel about their household finances and, and, and the future. Yes, because it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have consumers that are worried, even though everything's fine, if they're worried and they start cutting back on, on consumption, that then uh, means in, uh, businesses are selling less, they have to lay people off, and then you inevitably get that recession or that downturn in the economy. So how people feel drives the economy just like all these other things we talk mm -hmm. about. And it's funny, some of the, on the surveys, a lot of times it seems like Virginians are more optimistic mm -hmm. than the national average. Not always, but 
Uh, and, and talk about that. Do we just think we have a good economy? Is that it? <laughs> well, we, we are lucky for our labor markets, et cetera, that we are located at very close to Washington, D.C. And so if you look at the areas close to Northern Virginia, and then certainly Virginia Beach, because we have a lot of government defense contracts down there, the labor markets are very good. Uh, pay is very good. And so overall, since they make up together over half of the population in Virginia, we tend to have a higher sentiment value than the overall nation. You expect that the that consumer sentiment, which was at an all time low recently, I think you said that it'll pick up next quarter. Uh, I, I hope so, but you know you have this Russian thing going on uh, <laughs> that can uh, impact us here in the sense of gas prices and prices for other things like wheat and any that thing that that goes into the input for. So anything that Russia or the Ukraine are producing that we import or that we use in our production process can throw a wrench in that mm -hmm. hope. Just about a minute or so left, Dr. Alice Kassens, uh, but what's your uh, outlook for the rest of this year? Do you, are you bullish on the American economy this year? I think the, uh, the American economy is remarkably resilient, as we showed during the pandemic. And so I am confident that we will return uh, very strongly, including our labor markets, because I don't think there's anything wrong with our labor markets. I think it's just a readjustment uh, process, a reshuffling, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that will get um, fixed. Um, and so barring any other pandemic, uh, et cetera, I think our economy um, will return to a good place. It may take a while for inflation, for example, to get to places we're comfortable in. Part of that will depend on what the Federal Reserve Bank does. Um, but I am very high on the U.S. economy. Very interesting time to be an economist. It is. Okay. We'll have to leave it there. Dr. Alice Kasson, so great to meet you in person. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks um, for having me. I'm Gene Moreno. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org. Thank you.